Yeah, hello again. Let's go on with uh, some some remarks just on value added tax and namely on the first tap, step in the testing scheme that was taxability. You remember, I hope taxability meant nothing else that a tax, a German value added tax, can be thought as possible. So that the thing which happens um, falls into the scale, scope of value added tax, at least in principle. Now, um, here you see what we have to check in the course of time when we have to check taxability, at least when it comes to the basic rule of taxability. We shall ignore up in the beginning still importation of goods and intra community acquisition of goods. This is something reserved for later. So, the basic rule, which is 1, 1, number 1, USDG, you remember, says that transactions, deliver, deliveries of goods or services rendered by an entrepreneur in the indent for consideration shall be taxable. So you should read that in the translation or in the German original if you can. Uh, cope with German, and you should really do it, dog it up, because, you know, we deal with taxation and you have been already reminded of the fact that taxation always has to do with the text of the law and that the wording has huge importance. So, if you look at one, one, number one, and if we rearrange the conditions a bit, then it was spoken of deliveries of goods and services rendered by an entrepreneur within the scope of his or her or its entrepreneurial activities. So not in the private sphere for a consideration. And then a delivery of a good or a service must be given, nothing else. And this should happen in the inlet. Um, and now, according to the new sequence in which we have rearranged that, I would also propose you to underline the, uh, these five core criteria in the text. And my recommendation would be underline entrepreneur and acting within the scope of the enterprise or business in the same color take a different color for underlining for consideration and then take again a third color to underline delivery and in the inland or delivery and service in the inland so that you see in the inland refers to the question not if the entrepreneur is in the inland but if the delivery of service was made in the inland. When you look to the, um, to the wording of the text you see the if clause requires that all these five elements must be fulfilled together. So if only one of them is missing, the whole event can no longer be taxable. So then you can forget about the relevance of VAT for that specific event or transaction, which is under scrutiny at that moment. You can forget it and go to the next taxation because German tax law is then out. Hmm. Now, we have, as you see here, to test these five criteria. So in order to be able to test them, we have to examine each of them. And to examine each of them, we must know what they, what they mean simply. So who or what is an entrepreneur? First, please note that um, the word entrepreneur is a bit strange. Most people would talk or call him or her or it a business or a business owner. Now, in my translations, I have already used the term business in general taxation lecture for income tax. Now, value added tax means by the term something slightly different 
And so to mark that, I have chosen for the German term or for what is a business owner under the perspective of VAT, I have chosen a different term for it, entrepreneur. Huh? Whereas owner of a business is used by me in the income tax context. That is meant to simplify life. Now, um, that terminological difference shall remind you of that the meaning of the two terms in VAT and ESDG, income tax, is not the same. Um, and to keep that in mind, it's always a good idea just to use different terms. So then you see that the business owner in value added tax is not defined in the same way as a business owner in ESDG. And to call it by the same term would just be confusing. Um, you find the same strategy, by the way, underlying the German usage of words in the German tax acts. Because there we find also a similar differentiation in the terminology. Entrepreneur in the sense of VAT is in German called Unternehmer. Whereas an, on, an owner of a business in the sense of the Income Tax Act is called Gewerbetreibender. Um, simply the case. So if a German speaks of a Gewerbebetrieb, you directly know that you are now starting or in the middle of a conversation about income or corporation tax. So about income taxation. Whereas if somebody says, is that institution an Unternehmen or is it an Unternehmer? Then you directly know, oh, we are in the middle of a VAT conversation. Nice. So forget about income tax rules. You know, or perhaps you have never been clearly told it, that every German tax act has to be interpreted in principle independently from the other ones. So the world and the perspectives of value added tax act is something completely different. Absolutely nothing to do with the world and the rules and the distinctions made by the income tax and corporation tax acts. By the way, that even makes sense on a higher level because apart from the systematic approach, which says you should be able to reach one law in itself without having to read 10 or 20 other laws before you can understand the message of that simple one law. Um, but here in the field of value added tax versus income taxation, that clear distinction even makes more sense because as you know, the income tax and corporation tax are mostly still decided on by the German parliament, whereas value added tax is something where the German parliament is mainly a mere messenger to transform the orders of the EU value added tax directive into domestic law. So naturally, as we have different institutions who design the legal system here, it is nearly self-evident or automatically to be expected that we have different definitions of the underlying terms. And that makes it reasonable. We mark that also by using different techno uh, technical terms to remind you of that. So entrepreneur is what I uh, like to use for the owner of a business in value added tax. So, um, by the way, I have later found out that in English literature, uh, very often the value added tax literature calls these things a business. Um, now I don't have a bad conscience. Why? Because um, if for describing a German tax act with different words than people in England or America or elsewhere are used to, 
has a big advantage. Um, because in the beginning, when I took up the job and had to talk about my German legal background in English language, I always tried to find out the English technical terms with the, which the English laws really used for that. Now that has an advantage and a disadvantage. If, for example, when you talk about income tax and um, the English law distinguishes between different schedules of income, if you then use the same words and you describe the German seven types of income, then if you speak about income schedules in Englishmen or English person has directly a clear idea what you talk about. The disadvantage is the person from the other country, so that English person also directly has an immediate and clear idea of what you talk about. And so they forget, perhaps, about the differences which you have between the English and the German term. Now, that's the reason why later I found it more convenient to use a deviant, a different um, translation for terms in German law, because if I then talk about seven types of income, when I describe German legislation, then an English person will probably relatively easily understand, oh, that seems to be something very similar to our income schedules. But what is then avoided is the rough and wrong conclusion that it's exactly the same. So the different term reminds you a bit that you live in different worlds where the general idea might be the same, but where the details might still be different. And just out of professional precaution, I regard it as um, recommendable. That when I talk about the German Income uh, Value and the Tax Act, I follow that principle. And so I use a slightly different term from what the English or the Irish would use to describe their technical term for entrepreneur. Perhaps if they speak of business owner, then um, and they hear now that, that I speak here of entrepreneur, then they know perhaps there might be in the German transformation of the VAT law, there might be a slight difference still or something which the German administration interprets different still and um, which has not yet been clarified in court or so. It's just a general measure of precaution that different national laws might still have a difference. And so it serves to remind you that we are talking about German law here, so that somebody who then later takes a look into an English or Irish or Maltesian VAT Act sees, okay, from the terminology, okay, already, wherever I see a different term, I should always clear up if it's really completely identical. Or if perhaps under the VAT directive, a member state still has a right to choose between different options or so. So that was just talking some general stuff. Now let's go back to our entrepreneurship. What is it? Um, the transaction can only be taxable if it's made by an entrepreneur. So we need to define that. And if you find all the transaction is made by a non-entrepreneur, let us call that, in an unofficial way, always a private person. Um, then the whole delivery or service cannot be covered by VAT at all. So you need an entrepreneur. And that entrepreneur, ladies and gentlemen, must be the guy on the left side of our sketch. Uh, so the vendor of a good the seller of a good or the supplier of goods, but not the customer. It plays no role for one, one, number one. If the customer is an entrepreneur, that's not the point. The person who sells the good or service, that person must be checked if that person is an entrepreneur. So that's 
the first important thing. Yeah. Because sometimes people, when you tell them A does something for B and B is an entrepreneur, they say, oh, yeah, there is an entrepreneur, so it can be taxable. No, you need to check the right person, the person who sells or the good or delivers a service. Now, um, an entrepreneur is defined, you see that in the headline here of that slide, in paragraph 2 of the German Value Added Tax Act. And um, we should look it up there again. So if you have the Tax Act translations available, look up paragraph 2, section 1, USDG. If not, just believe me that an entrepreneur is defined as someone, someone who um, on a constant basis or in a sustainable way, way depends on how you translate it. The German word is nachhaltig. Um, renders services or delivers goods with the aim to achieve revenue independently. So to sum it up, somebody who independently, so working or acting for himself or herself, not on the behalf of others, and on your own responsibility. So you can decide if you want to do the transaction or not, you are with the boss. You do not need to justify yourself if you didn't do it or if you did it and it went wrong. Um, that's the characteristics of the boss of the enterprise, the owner. Whereas if you are an employee, very often you also can decide if you sell to a customer or not, but then you take the decision on behalf of somebody else and you are responsible for your decision to your boss. Imagine um, you work in a car trading house and the customer shows up and you say, um, at the moment I'm so unmotivated, please leave. If you are the boss, you can afford that behavior. Nobody can make you responsible for that. It's your car house. If you don't want to get rich, okay, your problem. But if you are the employee, you will probably have, after that one lazy hour, many, many free hours, because you get suddenly fired. Um, your boss will not share your sense of humor. And so that's the idea behind you act on your own account, on your, you decide for yourself without being responsible for the decision to somebody else. These two elements describe that you are independent, that you are the owner of the, the business, that you are the entrepreneur. Otherwise, you would be an employee. The criterion sustainable activity or an activity on a constant basis, we have also to find out what does that mean. Um, a general idea behind the term business or enterprise is you don't run an enterprise if you do something once, once only. An enterprise always conveys the idea that's a kind of a constant source, flow of revenue or profit even. Yeah. Not something which you do only once, so we will have to think about sustainable. And with the intention to generate revenue. This is the legal definition. So here you um, must notice that profit is not necessary under that definition here in value added tax. So even if you are a failure, if your enterprise produces losses, it still is an enterprise. And even if you did not have the aim to make profit, but only the aim to survive and cover your costs, you will be subjected to the value-added tax legislation because value-added tax taxes revenue. And so all institutions or persons who aim at generating and obtaining revenue are in the scope of VAT. So they can and should be taxed. But now let's begin to speak about these different criteria here. 
Um, the first recommendation is underline the word who into one, just to remind you that there is something which you should, could check and should check. Because which persons can be entrepreneurs, which institutions and which can't? Everybody who wants to achieve revenue on a constant basis can be an entrepreneur and is independent. So there was a famous example, or let's begin with the clear cases. Naturally, a natural person can always do something and earn money. So natural persons naturally can be entrepreneurs. Juridical persons have all the rights and possibilities of natural persons under the law, so they can make contracts and they can earn, earn money. Now the problem is, for example, partnerships. Partnerships are not a person, but uh, uh, a multitude of persons acting together. And under income tax law, when you had a partnership, you looked through and looked at every individual partner because well, there were, let's say, three people, three persons, A, B, and C, they acted together. And so you see only three persons acting together. The partnership itself was not seen as an independent entity. Um, you can, as a partnership, enter into a contract, but civil law would say, okay, um, um, liable are also the partners behind because the partnership is not really... Um, something different from the partners. Um, now imagine you treat a partnership like that in VAT law in the same way. It doesn't work. For example, remember, um, you must confirm VAT, which you charge as a part of the price in the invoice. And there you must necessarily name the entrepreneur. Now imagine you have a partnership, a KG, and um, the KG was founded by some family members in um, 200 years ago. And now in the meantime, in, by some seven generations later, you have 149 different partners of that partnership. And now imagine you would follow the approach of income tax law and would say the partnership is not an own entity, it's just 149 people acting together. And so you would have to name all the 149 partners on the invoice. And each partner would have to confirm his or her part in the amount which you paid to the partnership as having been received by him or her. You could only shoot yourself if you were the accountant of that firm. So for practical reasons, VAT law says, no, that makes no sense. We regard a partnership as if it were an independent person. So here we deviate from civil law and just say partnership under VAT law is taxable person. Partnership is different from the 149 partners. And so if a partnership sells you a good, the name of the seller is not the name of the 149 partners. The name is the A, B, C, K, G sold me this. This is the only thing which can work in practice. So you treat under VAT law a partnership as if it were an independent person. Um, this approach is not even restricted to partnerships. There are other ways to act or where um, people have doubted if something can be regarded as a person or as an independent entity which can be an entrepreneur under VAT law. And the answer of jurisdiction was um, everything is a who, everything is to be treated like a person under VAT law. Everything which can enter into contractual relations with the outside world. So a silent partnership would never make contracts with the outside world. That's the only partnership which can never fulfill that condition. 
all other partnerships can sign a contract and can make promises or can buy things. So they can take part like a person in trade activities and so they are treated like a person under VAT. Um, this makes great sense from the uh, perspective of neutrality of competition. Every institution which can in the legal system sell you something is liable to VAT. So whichever legal form you choose to own your business, this legal form is an entrepreneur. Um, you must, by the way, never forget, it's always the owner, the person, not the business, which is the contract partner. Uh, so not the factory is the entrepreneur, but the owner of the factory. And the owner can be a natural person, a juridical person. And now, surprise, the owner can be a partnership. Uh, or the owner can be some other association or so. Uh, but everything which has under civil law the ability to become a contract partner, one side of a contract can also act, can also become a who, an entrepreneur. Um, the, only, <laughs> the only thing which probably can never become an entrepreneur under present law is animals. There was a nice story which I heard somewhere and heard or listened or viewed somewhere on the web that there was a hen um, who produced an egg every day and evidently it was a very intelligent hen. So the hen had found out that the farmer feed it in return for the egg. So, um, and it was a nice little farm in lucky time, so the hen could freely walk around through the farm. But every morning or so, when the hen wanted to deliver an egg, she sat down on the threshold of the farmer and placed the egg directly there so that the farmer could find it there. And then proudly went away. She had delivered her egg in return for food, which she knew what she would get from the farmer. Now one could say the hen acted on a constant basis. She acted for consideration. She delivered eggs. But surprise, she couldn't be an entrepreneur because hmm, animals can have no rights and no obligations under the legal system, at least here in Germany. And so the hen could not be regarded as an entrepreneur, which is good luck for the hen, because otherwise the hen would have been liable to fill out a VAT declaration. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is something which nobody can ever want. Naturally, here you see, um, assets can never be an entrepreneur. Assets can have no rights. The owners can have rights. And contract partners can only be persons or a multitude of persons or juridical persons. So that explains why certain institutions can become um, an entrepreneur and others cannot. Okay. Now, what's meant by the term independent? Um, independent, the basic idea is you must be the boss of the enterprise, so the owner. And under which circumstances will you be the boss? And I already mentioned that you are the boss if you can act freely, decide freely about which contracts you enter into and which you refuse to do without having to justify yourself for your decision um, in front of uh, somebody else, your boss, for example. So an employee has to follow the orders of the boss and has to justify his or her decisions before your boss. So not independent. So they act in the name of and on behalf of the principal, the owner of the firm, so they are not independent. Hmm? Um, second aspect, if you are an employee, the money which is paid for the things which you do 
it's not your money you receive it in the name of your boss again so you act not on your own account uh, whereas the boss of the enterprise does it um, that is the person who can keep the money and use it to pay off his or her debts or to spend it for consume so no. the employee just has to pass on the money to the boss now naturally one could have the intelligent and very clever but um, unsuccessful idea to say then if only the boss can act independently and I have a very clever idea I am the boss of the car trading uh, shop and I never sell anything myself I just put my, bring my employees to the front then they sell and they are no entrepreneurs so I don't have to pay value the tax the mistake which you make there is naturally all the employees when they act for the firm they act in your name so you know it's you who acts because under a legal aspect somebody who represents you who acts on your behalf is nothing else like a kind of a telephone on two legs and with two arms speaking your will like a kind of semi-automatic device which speaks for you so whenever an employee sells you a car in a car trading shop huh, it's not the employee who speaks with you and not the employee with whom you negotiate under a legal perspective it's the boss himself herself or even itself huh? surprising effect remember civil law an employee of a gmbh if that employee speaks to you in the name of the GmbH you have just spoken with a juridical person and the juridical person answered to you under normal circumstances that would be a clear sign of madness but under civil law it's possible so you can speak with a GmbH good morning my name is Dr Smith I want to speak with the managing director and if the manager director of the GmbH asks, uh, says something in the name of the GmbH legally, you have spoken with the GmbH. So that is the reason why naturally, if an employee acts, it is the boss who acts. Huh? And so everything will be done legally by somebody who acts on own behalf and own account. Because if somebody does not act on own behalf, an own account that person acts for somebody else and that the boss then legally does the transaction and so you cannot escape the qualification here as taxable transaction just by tell by saying well um, I always have my employees doing business so I avoid VAT it doesn't work if your employees work do business it's legally you who does it now the next criterion um, you must have the intention to achieve revenue enterprises economic activity so usually economic activity means you need profit in order to survive or at least cover your cost so one would expect that an enterprise is described in VAT as an institution which wants to make profit but big surprise you see that's not the case they insist only that you want to want to make revenue so that makes sense because imagine you or I found an institution which is deliberately aiming at making losses so we just sell our products at 99% of their costs and our aim is to ruin all our competitors or imagine we are rich we just want to be nice to our fellow citizens and say we subsidize your consume in our case you don't have to pay um, prices which cover the costs we bear the rest now imagine this would be 
no enterprise which aims at profit. Now, if you were now, or we were now out of scope of value added tax legislation, that would mean we could even avoid to pay value added tax. So if we sold at 99% of cost only, we could afterwards even be approximately 20% cheaper than all other, other competitors because the others would have to pay VAT and we would not. And that would mean our institution, because of being exempt of VAT, would be able to ruin all the other properly working uh, enterprises. And so in the end, we would, by our generosity, ruin all the properly working enterprises in the economy. Naturally, as we always suffer losses, we would also go under in the long run. And so you see why it's not a good idea if a legislator says VAT is only charged for enterprises which want profit, you must charge VAT on everybody who renders services for money. So revenue must be sufficient. You can leave nobody out who achieves turnover revenue from sales. And that's the, the background here. You can, by the way, easily keep that in mind because um, just the distinction between income taxation here and value added tax. A business under income tax is something which wants to achieve profit. An enterprise under VAT is something which wants to get revenue. Well, how can you keep that in mind? Well, ESDG wants to tax profits. So they only take into account institutions which want to, to generate profit, because otherwise there would be nothing which they could tax in the long run. VAT wants to tax the revenue from sales. So according to that basic idea, everything counts as an enterprise which can and wants to generate revenue from sales. Another aspect which you see here probably is, uh, which is not clearly mentioned on the slides, so I have to mention this uh, just now. Um, the condition here is not that an enterprise achieves revenue, but that it has the intention to achieve revenue. Now you will say, where's the difference? Well, um, indeed, it's, it's relatively Rarely that somebody achieves revenue without having the intention to get revenue. One can even say if you have revenue, you also had at least as an additional intention to achieve it because if you had no intention to get revenue, you could just have refused to accept the money. So whoever achieves revenue also had the intention to achieve it. That's plain and simple. But the intention to have revenue makes you into an entrepreneur. Makes you an entrepreneur. Um, that has great consequences in certain rare cases. Imagine you plan to open a supermarket. So you erect a building. You buy shelves which you put into the supermarket. You buy stock, cans with food, other nice stuff. Now, you had the building painted naturally before, everything's fine, you've got a pile of invoices which you all paid, and now, tomorrow, there will be the great opening and the customers will come. What surprise. In the middle of the night, a lightning stroke comes, finds your supermarket, hits it, now, unfortunately, the only thing which didn't work was, yeah, don't know, something with the technology. So, supermarket catches fire at one o'clock in the night. And when you arrive there, seven o'clock in the morning, the whole supermarket has burned down completely. No shelves anymore, no cans anymore, no food anymore. Only a wide field of still hot ashes. Hmm. 
So your supermarket was gone before the first customer could in come in and before you could obtain your first coin, your first euro or dollar of revenue. Now the question is, have you been an entrepreneur? And now you say, why does it matter? And the answer is, remember, an entrepreneur has an output tax and an input tax claim. Everything which you bought for your enterprise purposes entitles you to a refund of the VAT, which was included in the price of the things and services which you bought. And now in that situation, you come to uh, the, the area of your supermarket and you see burning ashes. Yeah. Shit. And now imagine somebody says, well, you evidently have not been an entrepreneur, so you have no VAT input tax refund. We now regard you as a final consumer. So the VAT um, for the building is gone. The input VAT refund for all the food which was burned is gone and everything like that. And now that is the important aspect of that expression. Everybody who has the intention to achieve revenue is an entrepreneur. Evidently, all the circumstances show that was not private consume. You opened, you built that supermarket, you bought shelves, you bought all the stock um, with the aim to sell it. You even had an opening date. So your activity was clearly an entrepreneurial activity. So you should have been, or you must be qualified as an entrepreneur. And so you can have the input tax refund claim and nobody can deny that. So here you see how the concrete wording can really decide the fate, the economic fate of somebody. Um, and that might be millions, these two or three little words with the intention to create or create the chief revenue. Yeah. Sustainable, ladies and gentlemen, is another condition. Uh, an enterprise only exists if it is uh, planned to act on a constant basis or in a sustainable way. So something which can survive and be held up in the long run. Um, the German law would use the rather old fashioned term nachhaltig. Now, what does that mean? The first is, okay, there is a basic meaning, which means um, continuously, not only once, at least not only once. So the courts have usually held the interpretation that sustainable means with the intention to repeat a transaction, to act more than once. That is a sustainable activity. But um, if you then in, in apply that in a literal sense, um, that would lead to very strange outcomes. For example, you are a private person, probably you are older than 18, perhaps you are 22 or 30, or you will be. And then you will ask yourself a question in the long run. Did you ever sell a car which you owned secondhand or did you all crash them against the road? Um, if you ever sold it secondhand and then bought a new car, uh, do you intend that you plan to sell that second car also secondhand um, when you no longer need it? If so, selling cars, check this, selling cars would be an activity which you do on your own behalf because you sell your own car. You can keep the money, so on your own account. 
So that makes you acting independent in that, with that regard. Second, you intend, you intend to um, repeat that transaction. You already plan the next second car will also have been used three years, four years, or even 10 years, and you are going to sell it off instead of just leaving it stand around somewhere. So um, it, you plan to do that not only once, and if you intend to sell it, you plan to achieve revenue. Now the question is, is that selling and cars from time to time when you no longer need them, does that turn you into an entrepreneur under the uh, perspective of valuated tax? Literally, that could be the case, but this is far too unconvincing from the result that cannot convince because then nearly everybody in the population would end up as being an entrepreneur. But an indirect tax was originally set up to avoid just this. You wanted to tax one entrepreneur instead of taxing the consume of thousands of cons consumers. So the whole idea would be ruined by that. And now, fortunately, we have the wording of the EU directive and that helps because the EU directive says that the member states tax the taxpayers and defines taxpayers as all persons who produce goods, trade, offer services, or rent goods to others for consideration. These people have to be taxed as entrepreneurs and nobody else. And now you know that the German law has to follow the orders of the VAT directive of the EU as far as such orders exist. So when the car second-hand repeated selling case came to court, and indeed such a case came to court, the BFH, the highest German court, had to ask the European Court of Justice. According to our literal understanding, sustainable means every activity which somebody at least intends to repeat, so which is not restricted to being done only once. Um, but now we see in the VAT directive that we can only, that the German parliament is only allowed to mean these four categories here, which are listed. And, um, well, somebody who sells a privately used car after some years is not a producer of cars. That person doesn't offer services and a renting or letting goods for rent is also not given. Can we speak, can we see this as trade? And the answer was no. Huh? Here, if you drive a car for years for your private consumer and then get rid of it by selling it, this is simply the last phase of private consume. It's typically not a trading activity if you buy for own usage and then sell. So the courts have since then constantly held that um, sustainable or cons constant activities can only be seen where somebody resembles at least one of the four categories. So that if you sell things to others which you have before bought, that you have at least to resemble to a trader. Um, and it's usually not a trader's behavior to use things first for own personal purposes and then sell them. Fortunately, <laughs> because if you buy a, a toothbrush, <laughs> it would be a strange idea if this trader had used that before. Um, an interesting case is, for example, if you sell goods secondhand on eBay. Um, if you do that with thousands of things, you begin to resemble to a second-hand shop. Also, a second-hand shop, second-hand trader, could go get his first supply of goods from private goods which are no longer needed. So then the sheer extent of what you do would mm, turn you into a trader. On the other hand, when you just sell from time to time things which you want to throw away for money. So instead of 
filling your waste bin, you say, I offer it on eBay for a slow, uh, low price. If somebody wants to buy it, then they buy it. Um, as long as you do not do this in an enormous extent, that would be rather not resembling a trader's activity. But when you begin, for example, to buy things secondhand, use them for a day and then resell them, then it might uh, change the perspective. Because then selling and reselling gets a higher importance for you. And you don't only buy for profit consume. So there might be things where um, drawing the line between what is trading activity and not could be difficult. Um, usually one tries to um, design one's, one's behavior in a clear way. Okay. Um, Still, some people are covered by the definition of entrepreneur, which you normally would not expect to be an entrepreneur. For example, a retired employee is a member of a garden club, EV, so registered association. And once in a year, the club organizes a summer party and there is a barbecue. So um, the retired person buys sausages and steaks, uh, is an idealist, organizes the grill and um, the prices which are charged to the visitors are only calculated that they can cover the cost. Usually a little loss will be incurred, but our employee is an idealist and says, well, the club has no money to do it. I do it. I buy the sausages. And so, and so in the end, I, I'm satisfied if the party is a success and I, if I roughly recover my money and if 100 euros lost, okay. That's worth it. And um, no money charged for the working time and so on. Is that employee who organizes the barbecue, is that person an entrepreneur? And the answer surprisingly is yes. Because that employee, um, we cannot just say we feel that can't be an entrepreneur, but we have to test the definition of 201 USDG. Barbecue organizing member of the club does this activity on his or own, on his here own account because can decide on his own, can keep the money, so is independent. Acts in a sustainable way, does this several times. The intention is I do this every year. This is his, his traditional job. So, um, and sells goods for money. Yeah, so all the conditions are fulfilled. Our friend is an entrepreneur. Now, that would surprise our friend here. And that would surprise us too. So if somebody really did this garden party organization, um, then this person probably never handed in a VAT declaration. And so the question is, do we have to put that person in prison because of VAT tax fraud? And the answer is, well, the legislator must have seen that problem. And nearly everybody does such a thing at a certain occasion. And so you would have to arrest nearly everybody and that can't be. And so um, it is already inbuilt in the law that there is an exception for small entrepreneurs. You find that in paragraph 19 USDG, persons whose annual turnover from ordinary business as defined in 19 USDG, that is what they usually do as core activity, did not exceed um, an amount of 22,000 euro in the previous year. And whose turnover for this year is not expected to exceed 50,000 euro. They are treated as small entrepreneurs. That means Although these people fulfill to one, they are treated as if they were private persons. So they don't have to pay VAT and they don't have a refund claim for what they bought or got as services. Now, a small entrepreneur is an entrepreneur, is only freed from the consequences of the status, but 
The law gives a small entrepreneur the right to opt for the regular treatment so that that person then can charge VAT on the output and can claim VAT refund on the input. That can be highly favorable for that person. But the nice effect of that paragraph 19 is, as the default option is, if the person doesn't act at all, then that person is a small entrepreneur and will ignored, be ignored by VAT largely. Then all the persons who do not understand what they are doing here run no risk uh, of being punished for tax fraud because if they do nothing and know nothing about their status, then they are a small entrepreneur and stay it. They do not opt out, so they have no consequence to fear. And that helps them greatly. So our friend here who organizes the barbecue regularly on his own behalf and own account is an entrepreneur, but no damage is done until that person makes a turnover of more than 22,000. And probably we can guess nobody is going to reach that threshold with such a barbecue organizing job should be otherwise a very, very um, important barbecue. That is nothing which people would then still do on that idealistic basis. Um, also people who do from time to time something on an independent basis, render some services, would be small entrepreneurs. So there you see the basic rule is fulfilled, but on the other hand, the law has seen the problem and has taken that into consideration and found a solution which greatly helps. So let's sum up what we have learned here. The term entrepreneur has to be tested. And the first thing is, who is the entity which makes the contract? That person is the entrepreneur. Is that entity acting independently on own behalf and own account? Yes. Is it a trade or professional activity that means aiming at revenue and constant basis. So if that is the case, then we have to deal with an entrepreneur. And then this first criterion is fulfilled. So you have to check properly all these, basically three conditions, independent activity, aiming at revenue, constant basis or sustainability. Then things are fulfilled. Good. So we have already um, found out what the first of the five criteria is. And now it's clear what will be in the next video, the second criteria on the scope of the enterprise. So what counts as being done within the framework or within the range of the enterprise activities. This, ladies and gentlemen, is naturally something for another video. So thank you very much for watching. Enjoy the break, which is to come, and um, hope to see you soon for the next video.